Okay, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm not sure that the division of the room is entirely equitable because I've got one half and everyone else has the, the other half, but um, anyway, as long as you're comfortable. Uh, if I start coughing, don't hand me my P45, just give me a lozenge or something. Um, so, um, yeah, so we're here today to talk politics and the title of my presentation or seminar today is Private Autonomy, Public Authority, Boundary, Contestation in Transnational Food Governance. Now, I bet that for most of you that sounds quite esoteric and a bit obscure and a bit inaccessible, and I'm hoping that by the end of my presentation you will understand precisely what that means and be completely clear about what I mean when I say boundary contestation, private versus public that sort of stuff. Um, this, is a, this is a work in progress. It's a blog that became a, um, a conference presentation and now it's a seminar. So I'm really just sharing some um, ideas in development here. So what am I doing? This isn't an existential question. It's a, uh, what am I doing today? Well, I'm doing um, two things. Firstly, I'm arguing for the existence of an ongoing political struggle. Um, I think a better way of saying that is that I'm asking you to look at a struggle that, we, that some of us know quite well from a new perspective. And I'm going to be identifying three dimensions of that struggle that are relevant. And I'm asking you to think about them as, as constituting this thing that I'm calling a struggle for publicisation. So you've heard about privatisation and we've got a sense of what that means. Well, I'm asking you to think about publicisation. And um, it, it involves, in various different ways that I'm going to go into in the first part of my talk, it involves an attempt to publicise the food system in three different ways and boundary contestation, so this contestation between private and public is a feature that is um, prevalent across each of the three different dimensions. So that's the first part, and then in the second part I'm going to look at how this uh, political struggle is playing out in a specific institutional context, the uh, United Nations Committee on World Food Security. Now at its reform in 2009, this promise to advance the publicisation agenda. Um, now, it, it, it's very much the case that we're unsure whether that is happening, or it's certainly not happening to the extent that we um, imagined it could in 2009. And what I'm going to argue is that one of the things that is inhibiting this is the lack of reflexivity amongst institutional actors. So I'm bamboozling you with yet more jargon, inaccessible, impenetrable, yet hopefully as I go through the, the, the seminar, we'll all end up being on the same page and have a perfect understanding of what it is precisely that I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> so, as I say, this is the idea. There's this political struggle and it's called the publicisation agenda. I'm calling it the publicisation agenda. And it has three different dimensions to it. What is shared amongst all of these dimensions is we're talking about an attempt to affirm the inherently public character of the food system and, um, and, and, and sort of uh, making claims upon public authority or public governance because of this. And the first component, therefore, of the pub publicisation struggle is this um, affirmation of the public character of the food system. So this is a kind of discursive affirmation. So it's affirmed through language, through ideas. And we can see this through the association in various different texts, in various different contexts, between an integral feature of the food system on the one hand and the fundamental needs and interests of people, local people, humanity on the other. So here's the, um, here's the first context here. This is the Nieleni newsletter that some of you might know. And it makes this um, affirmation, when commons are destroyed or privatised, local people 
lose access to important environments for foraging, gathering, grazing, etc., etc. So we're seeing this, this, this affirmation here of this fundamental relationship between the commons and the needs and interests of people, local people. This is a document here that Patrick had a hand in writing. Um, again, it's the same thing. Biodiversity is essential to human survival and health. When biodiversity is diminished, disequilibrium results, etc., etc. So again, we're seeing this, this, um, this linking with this essential feature of the food system, biodiversity with the fundamental needs of humans. So this is a, as I understand it, as I'm interpreting it, this is saying these, this is a, an issue of, um, of public concern. And as an issue of public concern, it's an object of public governance, or at least it ought to be an object of public governance. So this is the second dimension of what I'm calling the publicisation agenda, an attempt to... Um, to expand the sphere of public governance. So to say, this thing here is an issue for public governance. And there are um, lots of different ways in, or examples that we can use to see this happening. So we can see this in the, um, in the, in the sort of cries or the demands of food sovereignty advocates for a re-regulation of the market. We can see it in attempts to enact new um, human rights instruments at the global, such as the Charter on Peasant Rights, that, that, um, that, that, that make the vulnerabilities being experienced by food producers a concern for public governance. We can see it in the Monsanto Tribunal recently that, um, that, um, that was, in the words of one organiser, attempting to fill the gap in global governance by... Um, subjecting a, a, a transnational corporation, Monsanto, to a kind of quasi-legal process. And this is an example that is a sort of particularly strong. This is the global campaign to dismantle corporate power and stop impunity. Now, they're pursuing a, a UN binding treaty on human rights and transnational corporations... Uh, and here we see very clearly, this is an attempt to expand the sphere of public governance so to, um, to, to cover TNCs. So the legally binding instrument must establish the obligation of TNCs to respect all international and national provisions and laws. So at the moment they're outside of international law and they're saying they need to be brought in. And another way of, of, of uh, describing that is to say the sphere of public governance needs to be expanded to include the activities of transnational corporations. Now this is crucial, this, 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 this idea, problematization. So in order to extend the sphere of public governance, you have to have a reason for doing so, and the reason is that there's a problem. We're identifying a problem, and this is what, uh, what I'm calling problematization. So in this instance, the problem is that TNCs are able to escape any control because of the unprecedented economic, financial and political power they command. This is the problem and it deserves the attention of public governance and we need to bring TNCs under the, uh, under the sphere of, of public governance. So this is actually happening, this process. This is ongoing now in the Human Rights Council. And this is really at the heart of, uh, of my argument, in, at the first part of my argument, that the publicisation agenda is about extending the sphere of public governance. And in fact, it targets public governance in two ways. One, it seeks to, um, to transform the quantity of public governance, so more of it, into places where it is absent. And it also seeks to transform the quality of public governance, particularly by ensuring that um, affected publics are able to participate in its exercise. So this is another way in which public governance is extended to include or to enable the participation of affected publics who are 
um, at present excluded from it uh, in its exercise. And this is a, a kind of a famous um, statement of food sovereignty by Lavia Campesina that encapsulates this, 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 uh, this aspiration. Food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems, a right of um, inclusion within the public governance of food and agriculture. And I've written a couple of papers on this. Um, this, is my, this is my main research area, actually, this area. Um, <coughs> so this is, my, this is my first argument, then, the first part of my first, uh, yeah, my first kind of hypothesis. And I'm interested to see whether it has any resonance with you in the room. I'm looking forward to your comments and critiques later. There is this thing called the publicization agenda, and it has these three different dimensions. Now, um, it's important to note, this is a kind of a footnote, but the publicization agenda is not synonymous with food sovereignty. For those of you familiar with food sovereignty, there are um, the key actors who are I engaged in the publicization struggle certainly include a number of prominent food sovereignty actors like Lavia Campesina, but publicization is not reducible to food sovereignty because there are lots of actors who are, um, would identify with the publicization project. So, for example, who are concerned by concentrations of power in the food system, um, by agri-food corporations, but who would not identify with food sovereignty. And nor can food sovereignty simply be reduced to, to publicization. It's a lot more than that. But there is a strong de degree of overlap in the, the fact that um, social movements like Levere Campesina, who are very prominent actors within the food sovereignty movement, can be seen engaging in each of the three different dimensions of publicization that I've been talking about. The other thing that's important to note, particularly when we think about this attempt to expand the sphere of public governance, is that this is something that is arguably a kind of feature or property of, of healthy food systems, historically. This renegotiation of the boundary between the private sphere and the public sphere. Um, particularly in instances where there is a crisis that, that threatens confidence in the food system or is seen as undermi undermining the, um, the healthy functioning of the food system and public authorities step in and redefine something as falling within the purview of the public interest and therefore as, as being a kind of legitimate object of public governance. Two examples. The first is the, uh, the example of the, uh, the grain elevators in Chicago. Now, these are basically warehouses for storing grain that are associated with the development of um, railways, so, um, which affected the, uh, the way in which um, grain was transported. And these grain elevators, bless you, these grain elevators um, shifted the balance of power in the food system because it meant that the operators of the grain elevators um, were in a unique position vis-a-vis -vis other actors in the food system because they knew how much grain was in the warehouse at any given time, whereas no one else did. So they could play the futures market, they could you know, do all these deals with people that would, that would basically um, disadvantage other actors in the food system. And in 1877, the US Supreme Court issued its famous ruling that grain elevators and other such facilities were clothed with public interest and could not escape state regulation. And this is a brilliant book. If you haven't read it, it's a really good history of that, that period um, and food and ag around that time in that region. The second example, uh, BSE in the UK. Uh, this was a public health and animal, animal welfare crisis um, in the 90s and 80s arising from the recycling of animal parts into uh, animal feed um, and it, it ended up with you know mass culling of, of, of animals, piles of burning cows littering the British countryside, absolutely horrific. 
but one of its um, um, sort of uh, Im impacts or, or, or effects was that there was a public governance response. So um, there was a ban on animal protein in cattle feed. Um, yeah, certain animal parts were prohibited from being included in the human food supply, etc., etc. So again, here we see um, a set of decisions that were, up until then, the sort of entitlement of farmers, um, slaughterers, now being reclassified as having a kind of inherently public dimension and therefore being an object of public governance. And what these two um, examples illustrate, I believe, is that um, the public-private distinction is a historically specific analytical construct. So this is a crucial idea. So this idea of the boundary between the, the, the sphere of public governance and the, the sphere of, of private interests and private autonomy is not fixed, it's, ne it's negotiated, it's permeable, and it changes at different times. So when we see the actors within the publicisation agenda trying to extend the sphere of public governance by problematising, for example, the role of and the activities of TNCs, they're doing something that is, is a kind of historically recurring feature of food systems. And I would argue is a kind of a um, capacity or a, a move that is absolutely indispensable to the health of food and agricultural systems. But this is not being articulated in a vacuum. There is a counter position and indeed it's this counter position which is in actual fact, the dominant position that has actually um, contextualised the, the publicisation struggle, but also provoked it. And here I'm talking about the kind of hegemony, the dominance of what I'm calling here, others have called it also, I'm sure, the neoliberal modernisation nexus. So this is simply to say that there's a, a kind of a collection of ideas and practices and actors who are committed to a particular way of thinking about the food system. And this particular way of thinking about the food system embodies the, and, and at its core kind of um, expresses the, the ideas that we associate with neoliberalism on the one hand and modernisation on the other. And they're coupled together in this, in this sort of complex or nexus. Um, this, is a, this is a kind of a statement of some of those key principles. Now, this comes from a document that was um, um, developed um, through the World Economic Forum and that was um, particularly championed by a number of agribusiness TNCs. So this is in the um, immediate aftermath of a recent crisis in food and agriculture, the 2007-2008 food crisis, which, um, which, which absolutely kind of energised and shook up a whole load of debates about food and agriculture. And one of the consequences of this was that the TNCs thought, all oh, right, we, we can't just be reliant upon our, um, our structural power, so the power that they occupy because of their, the, the, their insertion into the food system or their instrumental power, which is the power that they exercise through lobbying, they also have to get involved in discursive power, so getting ideas out, trying to change the way that people think. Um, and so they, they, they put together this document, championed by agribusiness TNCs, but in fairness um, and, and somewhat problematically, this whole process was legitimised by a number of kind of... Uh, it, prominent food policy institutions and actors within the UN system, if pre others. But these are, the, these are the core ideas. So first of all, we see the private sector constructed as, as, as un unproblematic, key deliverers of development potential. So there's no notion of problematization here. It's, it's a celebration of their role. Public governance more or less written out, market-based solutions. No room for public governance here, it's the markets. And an emphasis on collaboration as the primary logic of participation. 
So when you collaborate with someone, there's a, there's a relationship of kind of parity, isn't there? There's not a, there it, it, it's, it, 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 it presupposes autonomous spheres of action and responsibility. I collaborate with you as equals. And this is very different to the, um, to the, uh, to the, to the, the, the aspirations of the publicisation agenda who are attempting to problematise. Apologies for all these multi-syllabic words that I'm dropping here. But here we can see then these, these core uh, principles. What's this next one? Modernisation. Stresses the centrality of global scientific and technical in innovation. It's global. It's not local. It's global. Now this actually is code for we're going to dismantle all the barriers that inhibit the, the flow of um, global scientific and technical innovation. So if you've got a, you know, a national seed sector, well, we're going to dismantle that because we want you to get access to hybrid varieties, GMO, etc. If you've got a trade barrier that's inhibiting the flow of uh, um, certain goods, staples, we want to get rid of that. So this licenses a kind of a um, interventionist stance that, that, that is dismantling public governance and, and, and diminishes um, uh, the role of, of, of the public sector. But it's important to note, though, that this isn't... So it subordinates public governance, yet public governance is, is very much at play here because this agenda is, is muscularly promoted by a number and has been historically by a number of global governance bodies. The International Monetary Fund, um, through structural adjustment programs, loan conditionality, I'm sure we um, are familiar with this. Um, the World Trade Organization sets rules for international trade and um, the agreements that are negotiated under its auspices are binding upon its members. And if they don't, um, if they don't adhere to the trade agreements that are negotiated within the WTO, then they can be subject to a kind of a, um, a complaint by another member of the WTO and forced to forced to um, um, adopt the agreement. So we're seeing here a kind of subordination of um, of the state to these entities at the global that are very much promoting this neoliberal modernisation agenda and the World Bank as well. What's next? Okay, so that's the first half then. So that's my argument. Publicisation agenda, not in a vacuum. It's in a context where neoliberal modernisation is particularly strong, so on and so forth. So now we're going to move um, to a specific institutional context, the United Nations Committee on World Food Security. Now, why is this body important? Well, because it was reformed in 2009 and um, it, during its reform and immediately after, there was a very strong sense by advocates of the publicisation agenda that this body was going to provide a platform for them to advance their agenda. Why was this the case? Well, because first of all, uh, the CFS aspired to be the central United Nations political platform dealing with food security and nutrition. The institutional architecture of food and agriculture at the global level is incredibly fragmented. There's gazillions of different entities that are involved in doing food and ag stuff at the, the global or international level. And after its reform, the CFS aspired to be the central United Nations political platform. This was great for civil society because it meant, okay, we don't need to attempt to project voice across all these different arenas, which is impossible for us. There's one body here that aspires to be politically central. It was reformed. There's some other features that I'll go into, but it's uh, important to note that it was reformed in, again, this, the, the, this sort of context of heightened interest in food and agriculture, particularly food security um, arising from the... 2007-2008 food price crisis, which, which hugely elevated the importance of food security in the, if you like, the global political agenda and made uh, it, it a kind of key issue for political elites. Um, and in amongst all of that kind of heightened attention, 
the issue of um, the, the reform of the global governance of food and agriculture became very prominent and through a kind of very fascinating process, the CFS ended up being reformed. And yeah, that's, that's a sort of historical detail. But why, was it, why does it promise to advance the publicisation agenda? Well, as I say, there's this aspiration for political centrality, but it also had an aspiration for radical inclusivity. So the reform blueprint of the CFS extends the formal right to participate in its work to um, 11 civil society constituencies, most of which are, um, are not really typical participants in global governance, and that's putting it mildly. So I'm, we're talking about small-scale food producers, art artisanal fisher folk, pastoralists, um, the landless. So this is, this, is, this is kind of unprecedented in the history of the UN system, that these, these constituencies now have a formal right to participate, and included amongst their ranks, of course, are many advocates of the publicisation agenda. So they've now got a formal right to participate in a body that aspires for political centrality and, um, and, and um, that frames its work very much in relation to, the, uh, to this idea that there's a policy debate going on at the, at the global level. Post-food crisis, everything shook up. And there's a big debate about what needs to be done and how we're going to be doing it. And the CFS framed its work um, on those terms. So at the time, those of us who were there, Patrick was there, I was there, were very excited by what had happened and felt that there was a huge breakthrough in the global governance of food and agriculture. And this sense of kind of optimism was... Um, was very much shared by a lot of the social movements and other activists who, who had been participating in global governance for a long time and felt that this was a, a, a very significant breakthrough. And um, as I say, it, it promised to be a platform upon which these actors could advance their publicisation agenda. Fast track to 2016, this sense of optimism has kind of dried away. It, it, it's, it's faded. Um, th there are still um, a number of people who believe in the CFS and its potential, including me. I'm, st I'm still working on it, still committed to it. I'll be going there on um, Friday. But um, as captured in the theme of, the, of, the, of um, the civil society mechanism's reflections last year, so civil society in this body... Uh, participates through an autonomous mechanism called the Civil Society Mechanism. And last year, the theme of their reflection prior to the annual meeting of this body was the CFS at a crossroads. And this sense of uncertainty was reflected in the comments of, of, of people I, who, who have been involved in the work of this body for a long time, who are now starting to question its, 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 um, its relevance and starting to look beyond the CFS now for the first time. Now, I'm not going to kind of do an inventory of, of, of the different ways in which the publicisation agenda is being frustrated in the CFS. And it's important to note there have been some fundamentally important successes in the CFS. It's not all bad, but there are some, some major challenges. And if we were going to look in more detail at a lot of those challenges. We'd be paying attention to the colonisation of the CFS by neoliberal discourse. So the CFS doesn't produce policy outputs, it produces products. Um, a forum for the sharing of ideas prior to the annual meeting of the, the, uh, its plenary, it becomes an information market. I want to sell these things in an American voice, I'm not sure why, but uh, it's an information market, man. So the colonisation of the CFS by neoliberal discourse, um, persistence, re persistent reluctance amongst the, the, the decision makers of the CFS who are member states to, um, to attempt to endow the CFS with political authority. So as I say, in the reform blueprint, it aspired to be the central political space yeah, every juncture where that could really have been operationalised, member states have put the brakes on and said, no, it's a platform, it's voluntary, we're just discussing, it's not binding, we're not going to monitor our, 
uh, you know, the implementation of our outputs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so there's this persistent kind of reluctance. Um, there's also a general resistance of member states to discursive contestation, policy debate. So now we're seeing negotiation really get sidelined and get kind of diminished in the, in the agenda of the CFS. So after its reform, the CFS engaged in um, a number of quite significant policy processes and now it's, it's, it's doing that less and less and member states are complaining of negotiation fatigue. So they're just not up for the debate, really. Um, and persistent challenges facing non-elites seeking to attain effective participation in its work. So they have a formal right to participate, but to what extent are they able to convert that formal right into effective participation? Well, for many of them, they're not. And there are a number of um, organisations that and individuals who have been able to, 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 um, to, to sort of equip themselves with the capacities and tools that they need to participate in the CFS, but many haven't. Um, it's a struggle for them. But what I want to focus, though, upon is, um, and this is the sort of, this is the, the main part of my, my second argument. I apologise for this sentence in advance. So, <coughs> as we saw, the publicisation agenda involves an attempt to problematise the private sector, to say this is a problem and we need um, a public governance respond to uh, deal with it. But in the CFS, uh, something that, in, that in, inhibits their, their um, struggle in that regard, so their attempt to problematise the private sector, is this the way in which it, it is the, uh, the multi-stakeholder logic. It's the, it's the pervasive influence of the multi-stakeholder logic. When the CFS was reformed in 2009, it described itself as a multi-stakeholder body, but not at the time, no one really picked up on that as being problematic. It, it, to me, and I, many others who, who have been analysing this body for a while, they, it just seemed to sort of fall through the gaps, and it's only now, actually, that the really problematic impl implication of that can be seen. Now, why is this problematic? Because it constructs the relationship between public authority and the private sector as one of collaboration. We saw that before, looking at neoliberalism, which excludes a priori, so it means that it ex excludes before any discussions have started, before any evidence has been mobilised, it excludes the possibility of problematising their positionality. So, as I say, if you're collaborating with someone, you're not then going to start... Um, you're not going to problematise their very role in, the, participate in the, the partnership or the collaboration. It has a particular... Um, it has particular implications for how the relationship functions and how it is constructed. And furthermore, as, as I say, so by doing that, they reify a historically contingent interpretation of the public-private boundary. Reify means they turn it into a thing. So as we saw, historically, there have been times where this boundary between public and private have been redrawn in the face of crisis, whether it's uh, a crisis uh, pertaining to, um, to livestock or a crisis to do with the way in which new technologies disrupt the balance of power in the food system. There have been these crises which have then resulted in a redrawing of this public-private boundary. But if, you, if public authorities construct their relationship with the private sector as one of collaboration, they, they exclude this possibility because collaboration implies distinctive spheres of agency, disti distinctive autonomous spheres. At least this is my hypothesis, idea, um, insight. Does that make sense, that sentence? Michael, would you like to... So your, your explanation is fine. The language is imperfect, but it's, you know, there's a famous quote by Churchill. He said, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry this letter's so long, I didn't have time to write a shorter one. 
Now, I'm, I'm getting my thinking together, which means I'm drawing on these ideas that have a kind, they're like shorthand, you know, they have a, they have a to me, they have an immediacy and they, they're like um, holding, holding concepts, holding ideas. And I'm, I'm working my way towards finding more accessible and, um, yeah, language. But, um, but as I say, it, so all it means is as the, um, so historically contingent means that the way that boundary is understood depends on, you know, the, the place, the time. So in Chicago, following the, um, that, that ruling uh, by um, the Supreme Court, that boundary was redrawn. So it was understood then as being permeable and redefinable. But now, uh, um, in, in the age of neoliberalism, that boundary is, is framed as being less permeable. Um, is, is that's all it means. Are you all in no, but just this is a key point, so I just want to make sure everyone's <laughs> travelling with me. Um, yeah. So this is, my, this is the idea that this is how multi-stakeholder logic works, and we can see this, um, this, this logic encoded, so written into, expressed into the reform blueprint of the CFS itself. So as I say, at the time, none of us, none of us really saw it, 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 it as being there, but now it is possible to see it, to see it there. And it's here in the, um, in the roles that are assigned to the CFS. And the first role, I believe, is coordination at a global level and uh, provide a platform for discussion and coordination to strengthen collaborative action. So that's, that's it. The logic is it's about collaboration between governments, yada, 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 private sector organisations. So it, it can't even contemplate the possibility that, that TNCs might, might have to have their freedom and power checked by an extension of public governance. All it can do is contemplate a collaborative posture. So the idea is that we can win-win our way to success, whereas this isn't borne out historically by the way that food systems actually function. So this is the idea then that um, um, at last year's, so, so we can see the multi-stakeholder logic written into the reform blueprint and we can, we can see this logic expressing itself in the actual way the CFS functions. So last year, um, some, some, uh, uh, an organisation from Canada, the ETC Group, turned up at the, the CFS and they were very concerned with a set of kind of developments in the food system that they regarded as having huge detrimental impact upon efforts to negotiate climate change, to promote sustainability. Um, and the, 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 the problem that they were talking about were mega mergers between different agribusiness corporations from different sectors who were coming together. Multi, multi-billion dollar mergers that were going to, you know, e amplify concentrations of wealth and technology in the food system even more than they are now. And they wanted to put this on the CFS agenda. And, and the agenda of the CFS is negoti negotiated very painstakingly throughout the year. But the ETC group argued we have to be able to respond to emerging issues, otherwise we can't fulfil our responsibility as this central political space. And they eventually managed to, to win a space to discuss this issue, mega mergers. And right at the heart of their agenda was this attempt to problematise this, this development, that these, the plans, the, the thinking of these corporations is problematic and we need to we need to stop it, we need to, we need to clamp down on it. And they organised this session and it was quite poorly attended by member states, there were hardly any there. Were you there, Patrick? For that? Yeah, so there weren't very many member states there and the session didn't really have much of an impact. But we can kind of infer the reaction of institutional actors um, by looking at the response of the chair of the CFS in another session that attempted to do the same thing, so attempted to problematise TNCs, but this time in the context of a discussion about conflicts of interest. So the, the, the idea was to say we have th these, these actors 
have, an, have a set of interests that are kind of irreconcilable with the attempt to promote sustainability, ensure food security. And the response of the chair of the CFS after in this conflicts of interest session was, all must be involved in the search for solutions. So cognitively, she couldn't even contemplate the idea that, we, that this was a problem, that we have to, that this, that there, that we need to restrict their freedom of movement, we need to problematise what they're doing. She couldn't even accept it as an idea, and, and all she could do was articulate this, this, this collaborative um, uh, posture. Now, what I'm suggesting here then is that the multi-stakeholder logic um, it inhibits or frustrates the attempts by civil society to problematise TNCs in the CFS. It, it, so it prevents their ideas from getting traction in the CFS. But actually the multi-stakeholder logic has um, even more undermining effects because it doesn't just undermine the strength of their arguments, it also undermines their right to problematise in the first place. So as I say, when the CFS was reformed, we, we didn't really think the, well I certainly didn't think that multi-stakeholderism was a problem, we didn't see the signs. I went back to my interviews from the period, and this, was, um, this is a quote from someone who was a member of the Bureau of the CFS, this is the governing body of the CFS, and this individual was a champion of civil society participation in the CFS. During the reform process, they were very much a, an, an ally for civil society. And they say, um, we should not devote energy. So we're talking about how is the CFS going to function post-reform? How is it going to take on the, the debate around trade liberalisation, etc., etc.? And they say, we should not devote energy to these polemical debates that would get us nowhere. It's just, this is the way to make people continue. People will be able to say the CFS is again that talk shop and nothing good came out of it. Good discussions on the CFS should be on the how and not on the what also. Civil society has to be meaningful and constructive. If they are there shouting the devil, the problem and not the solution, it is not helpful. So a champion of civil society participation is saying, yeah, you can participate, but you have to be collaborative and you have to be congenial and agreeable. And if you start trying to, trying to critique what we're doing or critique the role of different actors involved in the CFS, that's not acceptable. And this, of course, is well understood by social movements because as a leader of La Via Campesina, probably the world's biggest social movement that, that represents small-scale food producers and other um, non-elite food constituencies, he says, even those who want civil society included cannot bear to listen to civil society. So my argument is that this, I this is expresses an, um, the way in which the, the multi-stakeholder logic not just um, diminishes the, the power of, of civil society's arguments, but actually undermines their, their right to problematise. And the flip side of that, of course, is that you see the... In the CFS now, we see the privileging, the fast-tracking of actors and organisations that are perhaps more keen to work in this collaborative posture, more keen to play the game, as it were. OK, nearly there. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Concluding thoughts. Publicisation involves, via this act of problematisation, the attempt to transform the quantity, more of it, and quality being exercised by affected publics of public governance. In the CFS, this agenda is impeded by the multi-stakeholder logic, which constructs the relationship between public authority and the private sector as one of collaboration, which excludes a priori, the problematising of their positionality and by so doing reifies a historically contingent interpretation of the public-private boundary. Maybe I should interpret that, translate it into Klingon because it's, it seems equally, uh, <laughs> equally obscure. What can be done? This is the most important question. What can be done? So, 
engendering, provoking, eliciting, encouraging institutional reflexivity. What does that mean? It simply means getting the actors in the CFS to question their own biases, the way in which they um, take for granted a particular understanding of the boundary between public and private and, and reflect upon the way in which their interpretation of that boundary um, impacts upon their expectations for the functioning of the CFS, the role of uh, civil society organisations within it. So this is the challenge as, as I see it, and this is actually already happening in the CFS because, as I alluded to earlier, um, civil society organisations are pushing for a, for a kind of process around conflict of interest, and they're um, inspired by, to an extent, influenced by the World Health Organisation, where conflicts of interest discussions and awareness is much more further down the road. Um, so, is this analysis useful? Now, I just have to give a, a little bit of a, a sort of um, a digression here, bring a bit of a, a bit of a personal story in because. So, how did I come to this analysis? Well, when I was doing my PhD in um, 2008, 2009, I was working with this social movement, La Via Campesina, doing a research project for them. And I came back to my desk in the north of England after about a year and a half to two years of doing this research, and I thought, what the hell is going on? Like, what have I, what, what, what's my research about? And a key insight for me was um, recognising that La Via Campesina were attempting to, um, to, 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 um, to, to, to fill in a gap in global governance. And this gap is... is the absence of publics. There are no publics in global governance. It's an elite arena, and that has profound implications for, uh, for example, um, well, both the efficacy of global governance, so it's, its efficiency, it's, it's fit, fit for purpose, and it also has implications for its legitimacy. And La Via Campesina were attempting to fill in that gap by constituting themselves as a public and projecting voice into global governance. And from this insight, I've then been thinking about, well, what is the meaning of public in this context? And wrote a um, couple of papers that were very celebratory about the potential of this reformed CFS in 2009. I was there during the reform, went back in 2011, gap of five years, I went back in 2016 and I was shocked by what I saw when I got back. Because in 2009 and 2011, there, the, 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 the majority non-state non uh, constituency in the room was civil society. So there's about 200-odd uh, uh, member states um, in, the, in, the, in the CFS, maybe less, I can't remember the exact number. And Aside from them, the only non-state constituency used to be civil society. They were the biggest constituency. And civil society read the food sovereignty movement, basically. Um, when I went back in 2016, this was not the case. And it was this the, the changes were particularly evident through um, the side events. So there were, there were dozens of side events at the 2016 CFS, it will be the same this year, and the, the advocates, the exponents of the neoliberal modernisation agenda are there now en masse. The, the global agribusiness corporations, the, 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 the representatives of development institutions, and they're there and they're talking in their language, you know, catalyzing synergies in the market, you know, facilitating technology transfer, and I was shocked by what I saw and I, I was trying to process it over a couple of sleepless nights and I, and I had this insight that, about this idea of boundary contestation. So as I'm on a personal journey to, to process um, um, something I was exposed to. But is this idea of publicisation, like, does it have any value beyond enabling me to kind of make personal sense of something that I'm trying to interpret? And, that's a question I'm very much um, keen to hear your answer to. 
and it may or may not resonate with your, your work. You might think it's rubbish, doesn't make any sense, you don't really understand what I was saying. All questions are welcome. Thank you.